the Beale Lecture for 2014. Um, actually, this is the first time uh, we've ventured to run a separate Beale Lecture. Previously, it's been part of the, uh, the main conference. And uh, I, mean, I think this is a real opportunity to celebrate some of the successes in operational research and to celebrate some of our award winners. And we have two uh, speakers today, both of whom have... Uh, have won awards from the Society for their Thank work. Today is uh, Mark Elder from um, Simulate uh, Corporation. Um, Mark was winner of the Beale um, Medal in 2012. I'll just read some of the comments that were made about Mark's uh, career, not to embarrass him too much at this point, but I think he's going to tell us more. Um, Dr. Mark Elder has made an outstanding contribution to operational research both in the UK and overseas. He first studied, studied OR at Lancaster University, uh, where he graduated, perhaps I shouldn't tell you this date, but 1978. Um, and he started his career uh, in the automotive industry, working with British Leyland, uh, where he worked basically on simulation in, in the car industry. In the late 1970s, he was one of the team who created the CY software, which is the world's first visually interactive simulation software. And for those who are in the simulation field, you will now know that we all use visually interactive simulation as a result of that. Following this, Mark went on to help found the simulation company Insight Logistics, which developed the genetic simulation package. Mark uh, has been a pioneer in the field of visual interactive modeling and simulation obtaining his doctorate degree in the, this field from the University of Strathclyde, and he spent some time as an academic teaching and conducting research in this field at the University of Strathclyde. In 1994, Mark founded Simulate Corporation and has been CEO until uh, he announced his retirement. He really doesn't look old enough um, and <laughs> until in 2012. Uh, he continues there as chair of the board. The Simulate software has had a significant impact on the field of simulation. For the first time it provided a readily affordable simulation package which has been widely used in industry and the public sector both in the UK and in overseas. Through Simulate's educational licences as well and their support for academics, simulation has been introduced to thousands of students uh, across the world. I think it's fair to say that Mark's vision is that everyone working in any process should be thinking about how to improve it and using simulation to help improve that process. And in summary, I would say he's gone a long way to fulfilling that vision. It's a great pleasure to introduce Mark Elber to you, who's going to speak on journeys of discovery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stuart, that's very kind words, and thank you all for coming along here this afternoon, and, and thanks for, to Richard for the earlier talk, very interesting. Um, well, I'm, I'm absolutely not going to be talking about software this afternoon, you'll probably be, I hope, pleased to hear. Um, in, in, in fact, um, it's a little bit of a coincidence that I have ended up doing anything in the simulation field at all. Um, I think most of you know what I've been doing, and if you didn't, you've heard from Stuart. Uh, but actually, what I set out to try to do um, is really only the reason I ended up with the software that I ended up with. And I want to tell you um, a number of experiences over the years, most of which have come out of um, watching what happens in the um, consulting process. Um, to try to give you some sense of the way I believe we should, as OR people, be doing consulting when we, when we do it. And I've, so I've got some snippets I'm going to go through to actually give you some insights that have come to me by watching what happens when projects are going on. Then I'm going to try and draw that together um, in, a, in a way to try and understand that when we get um, at, at the end. But um, just to kick off, it really is... Um, a bit of a, a random walk life, isn't it? Um, and maybe that's why I came up with this title, Journeys of Discovery. I believe the process that you go through when you're doing some modelling with a customer should be a journey of discovery, 
and um, how I ended up doing what I ended up really has been a bit of a, uh, a random walk. Stuart mentioned 1978. Um, in fact, the, the 14th of August um, 1978, um, on Monday morning, is when I walked into British Leyland to start working in their OR group in, in Cowley. And um, when I arrived on that day, I was given a, um, a project to do. Got straight into a project, um, a statistical project, um, actually looking at the relationship between the, the, ch the price you charge for car parts and the group that an insurance company will put that car in. And I thought that's quite an interesting project to, to work on. But on the 14th of August, there were supposed to be two um, new graduates starting. Um, there was me and some other person whose name I've long since forgotten. And the other guy didn't turn up. Um, and by about the Thursday, they realised that this chap wasn't actually going to turn up. He'd gone off and found a job at some more interesting place and hadn't actually bothered to, to tell them. And my boss came into the room I was working in and said, Mark, can I have a word with you? Um, we've got a slightly embarrassing problem. This statistical project you're doing is, is very important. Um, but it's not quite as important as the simulation project that we want to do. <laughs> and the other chap who was going to do the simulation project, uh, would you mind swapping onto simulation? We know you're very interested in statistics. Would you mind swapping onto simulation? Just for a few weeks while we sort out another <laughs> employee and you'll be back on your statistical project. And um, that, as they say, is, is history. I never managed to escape the simulation, um, the simulation group. Um, so what I'm going to talk about, I, although my career has been dominated by simulation, in fact, dominated is probably not a strong enough word, the only thing I seem to have done has been simulation, uh, I don't believe what I'm talking about is specific to simulation. Um, you can decide for, your, for yourselves as we um, look at some of these, these projects. Do any of you recognise that? <laughs> um, I'm sure the younger ones amongst you won't. It's got a uh, rust on it, Mark, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually lusted after owning one of those cars. Indeed, it was one of those, it looked very like that, was actually my very first company car. Uh, when I joined British Leyland, we were doing a lot of work on simulating the, um, the, the production line that was going to build those. They were, uh, they were not on the market in, in August. I think we launched them in early 79. Um, the Mini Metro was designed to replace every other car. That was what the, the marketing um, material said at the time. Um, we were building lots of simulation models of that. Um, but... In particular, one that was quite important in, in all this history and um, in my view in the way, uh, about the way um, modelling should be done is, is that the difference between that and um, that which works on here, doesn't seem to work. Um, Not to worry, you've seen what the other one looked like. Uh, we won't go backwards. Um, the, is that this is a van. And we were asked a specific question. This project was to answer the question, which of the three production lines should we build the van on? The van was going to be about 20% of production. And um, maybe it's not working in either direction. How do we... It's, a, it's the metro, it's had an I will, um, without the slides, let me explain this project. We've got three production lines. Two of them are old mini production lines, um, and one was a brand new one we built for the metro. So they work, worked differently and had different parameters that um, affected their efficiency. So, yeah, so it's working. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Um, so we've got these three production lines, and we've got various parameters that determine um, how they operate, like the speed and, and reliability and so on. They've got different vintages when they were filled. So it's a very simple question to model that and, um, and come up with an answer. And I and my boss went along to present the conclusions of our report, and it was a big meeting with lots of other agenda items, and my boss stood up, and they said, right, operational research, which line should we send to the van down? We discovered all sorts of insights that we wanted to get over to these, these people. And my boss said, well, on the basis of the assumptions that you gave us, we believe it should be put down line three. And, and at that point, he was interrupted. And I only slightly characterised. The chairman said, thank you very much, operational research. We've got lots of items on the agenda. That's what we need to know. Um, and they moved on. And, of course, it wasn't 20%. It was a bit of a disaster, the van. It was less than 5%. And uh, lane 3 was not the right lane um, if it was not 20%. And we thought long and hard after this. What on earth are we going to do? What's the point in doing OR if we only ever get over the answer? We, need to, we actually find out um, lots about the character of a problem when we investigated and modelled it. What, what can we do to actually solve this, this problem? And some of you are probably thinking that I'm going to start talking about software at this point, um, but I'm, I'm not. We, what we did was we got a carpenter in Cowley to build us a board game. And um, if you look at this, um, you've got lanes that were the production lines, you've got these metal counters which represent each of the cars, each metal counter is a car going through the production line. We used dice to generate random numbers and what we wanted to do was to use this as a device to get our clients to understand what was really behind what we did. And we thought if they understand that they'll be much more interested in asking us questions about it and we can get over some of the interesting nuances that we discover. So we made an appointment to take this along to the Longbridge plant where the metro was built. And we got a half hour slot with the plant director. But the plant director's name was Mr. Savage. And he genuinely had a reputation for going by his, his name. He had a rep he, he'd been known to pick people up by the lapels of their suit and throw them out of his room. <laughs> Um, that's the way he operated. So we were a bit nervous going along there. But what actually happened was he cancelled all his appointments for the rest of the day when he saw this. And he started phoning people and getting in people from around the plant to come and look at what we'd developed. And we didn't get away until 8pm that night. <laughs> and he actually said to us, this is a quote that stuck with me for many years, Today has been the most valuable thing operational research has ever done for me. So we went away and thought, why? I mean, what's he got out of this? And of course, what we'd done is we got his people together. We'd actually caused them to get together in a room and work together to solve some problems. We'd simulated with this board game about 15 minutes of real production, the simulation stuff. The numbers have been a complete waste of time. They were not useful. But it was the fact that they got together and they talked about these things and they started to understand some of each other's problems around the plant that we'd actually, that's what we'd contributed. Now that was what went on to cause this thing called CY that Stuart mentioned to be developed. And we did actually toy with the idea of putting little lights all over this and connecting it up to a computer. But then you know, colour computer screens came along and overtook the world and things moved on. Winding forward, so remember that, winding forward quite a number of years, one of the first projects that we ever did at Simulate um, involved a company just down the river from us um, on the Clyde, um, although this project related to work they were doing on the, on the 4th. This company phoned us up and said, um, we... We've got a contract for berthing super tankers at the Hound Point um, terminal on the 4th. And um, another terminal is being built alongside. It's going to double its capacity. And they're going out to tender to, um, to, 
to um, find another company that can berth the super tankers um, on, on that um, jetty. And we want to win that contract. You know, we've got the contract for the first one. We own five tugs. Anybody operating the other one is going to have to buy five tugs. We think we probably don't need to buy five tugs. Therefore, we're going to win, win the contract. Um, these tugs cost um, five million pounds each. Um, they're incredible bits of kit. These, the propellers don't look like propellers. They've got these things <coughs> on the bottom, so they can move in any direction very smoothly. That's why they cost five million pounds each. I'll oh, remember to press the button on the keyboard. Um, and so we went along to see him. We collected a whole load of data from him on tide tables, um, information about which size of tanker is likely to arrive at what time and all these sorts of things. And we went away and built a model and took it back to him and showed it to him, actually not in a complete state. We hadn't put the tide information into it. There were one or two things missing. We um, left it with him overnight because he was keen on, on playing with it. And something interesting happened. He phoned us the next morning and said, I've been playing with the model overnight, and we said, well, you shouldn't have been because, you know, it's not ready for playing with yet. Yes, yes, I know, but I've realised I want to change the questions I asked you. Um, because playing with it, I can see that actually I can kind of logically work out. I know I've got to buy three tugs because logically I can't... This, you know, he gave, gave an explanation as to why you'd never need less than three and you'd never need four and, and, and so on. So it became obvious. And, but what the real question is, I'm going to have a lot more idle time. So it's how I crew the tugs that's the more interesting question I've got. And also, I think we can actually bid for another contract if we've got all these tugs. So suddenly, as soon as he saw the model and started to play with it, um, more ideas came into his mind. So that's another example of things kind of jumping about when, um, when uh, clients start to see some results coming out of models. So we, jumping back a few years, we, when we developed CY, we actually went, we saw it as being very useful and you know, we were showing it off at conferences and things and some of the work we'd done and people were saying, can we have this software, can we buy it and, and, and use it? And we persuaded the main board of British Leyland to let us sell CY publicly. Um, we always thought at the time that Michael Edwards, who was running it, was not doing very well at selling cars. We probably thought we'll try and make some money out of software. And one of the first customers was Alcan. Um, some of you may remember Mike Rhodes, who ran the Alcan OR group in Banbury. Um, and they built lots of models of rolling mills all over the world with, with CY. And Mike came along to see us for a review meeting after about a year of using it. And he said something which um, I completely dismissed at the time as silly. Um, I think some of my more experienced colleagues probably saw the logic behind it. But Mike said, you know, we've, we've realised something. Um, you can make a lot of improvements in a plant and, and uh, often completely solve the problem uh, without actually running the model. In fact, sometimes we don't think you even need to build the model. We think actually you can solve the problem sometimes just by asking the client the questions that will enable you to build the model. The fact that you've actually made them start thinking and go through the process of, of actually externalising what they think about their problem sometimes causes them to realise what the solution is, is to, their own, to their own problem. Um, another small example of this is that we... We, we were asked to help a company. They phoned us up and said, um, our head office is going to close us down, um, but we think we can do better. Could you come and model our, our process? And they make these things, the insulators that go on pylons, made out of the ceramic things. Very simple organisation, really, but huge stocks of different sizes of these things. So we said we'd do this project, and um, one of our consultants went off to, to see them. And um, by lunch, he was going off to be there for a week, and lunchtime he phoned me and said, I'm on my way back on the train. I said, oh no, what, what's happened? And he said, well, 
I've solved the problem already. <laughs> um, what do you mean you've solved the problem? Um, and their managing director phoned me up at the end of the day and said, that chap of yours, we do want him back again, but he's made such a big difference to us already, we wanted to rush off and implement his ideas. And basically, by asking some questions so he could start building that model, he caused this team to realise some very basic mistakes they were making about their stockholding policy. And they were so excited about realising this error, they wanted to go off and implement it immediately, without even having the model, the model built. Lots of these stories I could tell you, but um, they all take up quite a lot of time to tell. Um, the Baltimore Ravens. What can simulation possibly do have to do with Baltimore Ravens? We um, MVA is Maryland Vehicle uh, Administration. It's a bit like the DVLA for Maryland in the states, and they issue license plates for cars and and driving licenses. And um, any of you who've ever travelled in the US um, will realise that the kind of de facto form of identification that you use for everything in the US is driving licence. Um, and so it's quite an important piece of documentation. Um, and, but surprisingly recently, the US government realised this and also realised that if you try to get one of these driving licenses in some well-organised states, it's actually quite a tough job. You've got to provide lots of identification and history, and they really want to know who you are to make sure they properly issue with the right identification as long as you deserve it. Um, but if you're a terrorist and you want to get some identification in the states, and you do a bit of research, you will realise that you should go and live in North Dakota. <laughs> because um, in North Dakota, it's a very simple operation to go down the road and get yourself a driving licence, and it's then valid everywhere. Um, so the Obama administration decided to do something about this, and they introduced some very stiff rules on um, how you should go about issuing a driving licence. But of course, this makes the process a lot more difficult for almost all of the states who weren't up to this, this standard. Um, and in the states, you have to get a new driving licence every five years, so it's a, a process that's a lot of it going on. It's going to, I, I can't remember the numbers involved, but it was billions this was going to cost if you add it up across all the states. So they wanted to get very efficient. And Maryland said we want a simulation vest because we want to um, improve our process. And they've done lots of things already, um, I mean, they've got the self-service machines that introduce... You have to physically go into the office to renew your driving licence or get a, a, a new one. Um, but there were vast queues everywhere. This is a, um, a picture of one of their service centres. And you'd wait for hours sometimes. Um, and their measure of success is that they didn't want to be paying any overtime. If they're paying overtime, that's costing us money. And so they built, we, had, we built this model for them. And... Um, we were just trying to validate it. It was actually quite a complicated model. We spent quite a lot of time building it. There's a screenshot of it there. Um, all these uh, things are tilled, uh, not tilled, service points you can go to and there's a queue of people waiting and, uh, and so on. There was quite a lot of detail in the model. And all we were trying to do was validate it. And um, we couldn't get it to validate it would never match what was actually happening in the real world. And we were getting frustrated with it, and the client was getting frustrated with it. Couldn't work out what was, what was going on. Um, the, the, uh, we'd match it up to a particular day in the, in the real um, system and actually identify um, why it was wrong, and we'd put it right, and then we'd run it against the next day, and it wouldn't then match that day. It was a disaster, this validation process. And... Um, Eventually what happened was we went down and actually talked to people who were running these booths and watched what happened. It's the sort of thing you really ought to do as an OR person anyway. Watch what happened in a great deal of detail. And a chance conversation between 
um, two of the people on, on these counters and one of the managers, who didn't know what it was the managers we were working with, they didn't know what was going on, caused everybody to realise that the sole cause, the only cause of whether overtime happened or not, was down to a completely external force that was not in our model. Uh, basically the way it worked was people could come in up to 4.30pm and they'd close the doors and they'd then work till they were finished and they should finish by 5 but if they didn't finish by 5 they were paying overtime and they'd always finish by 5 if the Baltimore Ravens were playing that <laughs> evening <laughs> so the staff wanted overtime so they were just slow in the last half hour and they got paid overtime unless they wanted to get home to watch them game. So, I mean, that's not actually a case of where the model caused them to change their thinking, but it is a case of why actually you should build um, quick and dirty models, first of all, to get to the heart of what's going on, um, and then refine it over time to, to build detail. To build some detail in. Um, we, anybody know what that is? It is, yeah. It's a oh, well, it's a nuclear power station of some sort um, in North America, and um, that is a um, a temporary store for radioactive material. When you decommission one of these power stations, you've got got to get all the material out of those um, silos where the radioactive material has been stored. Stored. This is low-level radioactive material, like pairs of gloves and tools and that have become irradiated. And you've got to treat it and then put it into long-term storage. And it's a complicated business <coughs> of decommissioning a nuclear power station. And actually, as a company, we had no experience of modelling um, this type of process. A lot of this modelling goes on. But we were contacted by a North American um, nuclear power station that was to be decommissioned. They wanted a model. Um, when I say contacted, we got through the post a two-inch thick tender document. We had never you we'd never spoken to these people before, and I have to say my inclination was not to respond to this tender document. Clearly, it's been sent to all simulation companies all around the world. Um, they know who they want to use. Why are we bothering responding to it? But we had actually one employee who'd come from that industry, and he was keen to do this work, and um, so we did respond to this tender. Um, and to my complete shock, we won the project. We must have wildly underquoted, but um, we did win the project. And um, because it was all specified in this document, um, again, this is rather against my way of working, but it, because it was all specified, we just set to and, and built the model. And it's a vast model. I've got some screenshots of it here, just sort of panning around it. Um, it's, it's huge. Um, and um, we, so we built this thing, and we took a little bit less time to build it than we quoted. Um, so I think we had a couple of days left. So the consultant who had built it said to the client, why don't you come in and um, we'll um, do some runs with you, and we can do a bit of experimenting, we might do a bit of tweaking of the model if you need that happening. And he, he really welcomed this, so he came along and... Our consultant actually did what he always does at the start of a project, which is just to say, so what, what, what actually are you trying to find out? What do you want to solve with this? And the client said, well, it's this buffer in the middle of the process. Uh, th th we've got to build this buffer between things coming out of the silos and going on to the train that takes them away. And it's quite costly to build this because it's got to be you know, insulated for radioactivity and... Um, we want to know how much space we need in this, this, this buffer. Um, so the consultant said, okay, well, let me just, so I can get my head around this, I'm just going to um, draw, and he did what he always does, which is to open up Simulate and start dropping icons on the screen and, and drawing the process. Um, and the client said, yes, but you need to take into account this rule, and they put a bit more into it, and they put some numbers into it, and they ran it a bit, and the, consult the client said, well, that's not right, let's... Let's add a little bit more in here. And they added some more detail into it. And after a couple of hours, the client said, well, that's brilliant, that's fantastic, because it's clear that 
you know, this buffer um, needs to have four positions in it, or whatever the number is. It's kind of obvious, no-brainer. And then, according to the consultant, he went a kind of pale shade of green mm. and sort of buried his head in his hands and said, oh no, you've just answered my $64 million question with a model that's taken you two hours to build and we haven't touched the model that I paid you for 30 days to, to build. What have I done? <laughs> now, what's happened there is that an organisation has got into a process of deciding it's got to treat building a model, essentially a piece of OR work, like it's an IT project. And building simulations is not an IT project. You can treat it like an IT project, you can write a specification, you can, um, uh, for an IT project, you can write a specification for building a simulation model. But the task you're supposed to be doing is solving the problem, not um, building a model. And certainly not one model. Um, you need to build models that evolve as the client's thinking evolves. But it's quite difficult to persuade the client of that. You know, if we'd phoned up this company and said, we've got your tender document, but you're asking us to tender for the wrong thing, they just said, well, forget it. We've, we've got plenty of other companies that will respond to it. It's quite difficult to manage that process. Um, this one's a bit closer to home. We were phoned up by um, a big five consulting firm. Who I'm pretty sure he's not in the room today. Yeah. John, you're not. This is not you. <laughs> um, and they said, we're doing this huge piece of work for a well-known department store um, that has two completely different ways, it's got two completely different arms to the organisation uh, that work very differently, but it's got also got two finance departments. It doesn't need two finance departments, so we're helping them merge them together into one finance department. And we've got a big five computing firm in to build all the software for this and do all the process maps, but rather annoyingly, the end client wants a simulation of this. Can you build it for us? It's a real nuisance. We don't want them to... They, they don't need it, but the end client wants a simulation, so will you build it? Um, so we kind of said no, because that's not the right way to do it. Um, you shouldn't be building a simulation model to check that something's going to work. You should be building a simulation model to find out the best way to make something work. Um, and we all went along to see the end client um, here in London and um, <coughs> sat down with the big five consulting firm and the big five computing firm and the, cli and the client and so on and talked about this and one of our cons I wasn't there but this is the story that was told to me our, one of our sales people was, was there and one of our consulting people and this conversation was going around in circles the end client wanted the simulation model but um, was being persuaded otherwise and so on. And our consultant said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't we take one of your processes? Because the big five computing firm had already drawn out all sorts of flowcharts, this sort of thing. You know, this is how your expenses are going to work. This is the kind of drilled down version of it. All these sorts of things. And um, that, that's one of the eventual simulation models. Um, and the consultant started <coughs> drawing out one of these. He took that simple one, the expense claim and started drawing it out in a simulation model. And obviously it didn't have much data in it, but um, had to ask some questions. So what happens after this, and what happens after that, and roughly how long does that take? And he was putting these things into the simulation model. And we normally do these things in pairs. Um, so the salesperson was doing half of the job, even though it should have been a consultant. You, you have one person building the model, and another person um, actually... Um, talking to the client and not just keeping them interested but doing the questioning and answering so that the person building the model can concentrate on the model building and as they went through this process um, they asked a question which caused one of the end client people to suddenly say well I don't understand how it's going to work um, you know you've asked about what happens when an expense claim is not signed off because there's something wrong with it 
And your diagram shows that going back into the system and then going back in the queue to be re-signed or something. And you said that's going to take five days, but that means it's going to add up to more than the SLA we've got with the, with the employees. You know, we say we're going to pay all expenses within seven days total or, or something. How's that going to work? Um, and, of course, the big five computing firm said... Uh, well, not to worry, yes, hand us that piece of paper, we'll correct that, yes. And the finance director of the department store said, so hang on a minute, there's something wrong there, and you've been telling us for months all this was ready to go, and these chaps haven't even built the simulation model yet, and it's identified something that's, that's wrong in this process. Right, we're going ahead. And they went ahead, and we were there for months building models of all these things. Um, and the reason I'm saying this is because, again, there's an example of something which is not um, a fully spec'd out model, which is not something that's been properly validated yet. Um, it hasn't even got all the data in it, it, but it has contributed significant value to the process of the end client getting to where they want to, to get. So... Been through lots of snippets now. I want to try and, um, as it were, draw this together and um, so what I think kind of comes out of this. A few more screenshots. There's three obvious questions, it seems to me. What is it that's going on here? How in practice should we handle it? And perhaps the most difficult is how do you actually go and sell a journey of discovery rather than an IT project? Because actually most clients don't want to buy from you a journey of discovery. Well, they don't think that... But once they've got used to this, they love it. But they don't at the start. That's not what they want to, to do. Um, so what is going on here? Let's take that, that first. You've got um, your client with um, a vision in their mind that they've got a process that they manage where there are some levers they've got, there's some things they can control in their process. And they've got a vision in their mind as to how those levers affect the output measures. So there's, there's things they can control in their organisation and there's things they want to see happen. And they've got a bit of a vision as to how those things connect with one another. Right? But to build a model... You've got to transfer, basically, the levers into a model in the computer and hopefully get some more sort of accurate outcomes. Now, how do you do that? The only way you can do it is by somehow extracting information from the mind of the client. So you have to go and ask questions. And you have to delve into um, how their process operates. But usually quite a low level of detail if you're going to build an accurate simulation model. And actually what you're doing there is the client is being driven to kind of rationalise and, and turn into logic and, and surface all sorts of thoughts that are kind of um, milling around in their mind, but they haven't necessarily ever spoken to anybody else and actually gone through the process of really thinking out. And um, they've got to do that with their colleagues as well. And I've lost count of the number of times that we've been in projects, the first meeting of a project, and you're around the table, and it's quite obvious that the client group has not talked to each other about this problem before. All sorts of things are coming up, and they're saying, oh, Fred, I didn't know that. Do you really have to do that? You know, there's things that they, you really think they should have got together and started talking about before they started hiring an expensive consultant. So you've got to go through that process, and... Um, what actually is happening as you're doing that is some ideas are sort of developing in the client's mind. Because they're actually being forced to go through that thinking, what's in their mind is actually developing. And they're getting a better understanding of their process, even before the model has been built, because you're taking through the, them through this business of, of rationally explaining um, the way their organisation operates. So just turning that into words, um, modelling causes self-learning about the process detail. 
But by modelling, I mean, there's lots of different ways of interpreting this, but there's clearly modelling could be using a model, and I'm sure that contributes to it, because you use a model and you understand the dynamics of the process. The act of actually building it helps you think, but I actually think the most important thing that we're doing um, early on in the stage of the project anyway, is, is elucidating the rules for, to be able to build the model from the client. And it's the act of doing that um, which is helping the client really kind of develop their thinking um, around the, the, the thing it is you want to, to model. Um, how do we handle that in practice? Um, some of you will have seen these this little bit before, because um, I've got a way that when I'm trying to help people do consulting of saying, in practice, this is what you should actually do to make this work. Um, and first of all, you've got to get over a bit of a barrier when you do this, because we're our own worst enemy. You know, as OR people, we're technical people. So we love doing technical things like building models. But unfortunately, the model is not the objective. Um, you know, there's a building the simulation is essentially a technical task, but the real objective is to solve the problem, and building the simulation is just a small part of that. And this is about how you kind of recognise that and persuade the client to go along with it. So if you take the problem and you discuss that, and having discussed it with the client, you build a first quick simulation. And I, I mean, I encourage people to, you know, if you can't build it in a couple of hours, it's taken too long. But we have a, uh, one of our clients, is big client in the States is General Motors, and um, he's not there now, he's left, but Kevin Coles, who used to run that 60-strong simulation group, they had a rule, which is that if we can't go into a room after lunch with a blank screen, build the model, get the answer out, and the client goes away at the end of the afternoon to implement it, we've taken too long. I mean, they've practiced that for a long time, so they're quite good at it, but build, build a quick first simulation, and that will cause the client to gain some insight. Not answers, because, you know, half the data will be missing from it at the moment, but there'll be a model that's structured a flowchart, there's some animation going on, it's helped them do some thinking. And out of those insights, the client will have an idea. Oh, it's obvious I'm going to buy four tugs, but what are we going to do about the shift patterns for the crews? You know, ideas will come out, and that will cause you to evolve the simulation. Or perhaps throw it away and build a new one. Um, and you'll try the idea in the simulation, and you'll gain some more insights. And you will go around that loop. And you'll keep going around that loop, and you shouldn't worry about the fact that you're throwing models away and, and so on, <coughs> until suddenly the client says, great, thanks very much, I know what I'm going to do, I don't need any more of this. And you probably won't have written a report because the client doesn't need it, um, because they are confident in what they're going to do. And that we call the client learning loop. And if you concentrate on your clients, trying to drive your clients around that, rather than concentrating on building a model, um, it leads to success. So really, you've got this big arrow which is about solving the problem, and you've got build the simulation, rebuild the simulation, rebuild the simulation again as part of the process. And a little bit more on how to make that work. We ask two questions at this stage, very simple questions. What can you control, and what is your measure of success? And those questions generate enough um, talking amongst the client group to be able to start building your simulation. And then the building of the simulation generates more conversation, and you just keep building it up over time. So that's... Um, I'm going to skip... Right, I've got these. The last, the last one of these, then, is how to actually go about selling this journey of discovery. Because, like I said earlier on, 
you get this great thick tender document through and you um, decide that you're going to respond to it and that locks you into a particular way of working which means you think the client's going to be unhappy. How do you avoid that? Um, there are two um, approaches and both of them work from our experience. Um, one of them is a little bit more difficult to implement than the other. Um, one of them is less formal, one of them is more formal, so works more with the tendering process. The first one, I think, um, and certainly some of the people in Simulate think, comes from the fact that I was born in the East End of London. It's a bit of a sort of barrow boy approach, but it works. And what we, quite often a simulation project will, uh, a, a solving problem project will take a lot longer than 10 days, but we go in saying, in 10 days, you'll have one or two, maybe three models will have been built. Um, there'll be at least one workshop, getting your group together and working with the model. Um, you're going to learn something of value, probably something that's a lot more value than the cost of 10 days. And through that process, you will also discover what you want to do with the next 10 days. We don't know what that will be at this stage. It's probably carrying on building some models and investigating them. Um, it might be building a very complicated model. It might be taking things up to a higher level and looking over the whole organisation. It might be all sorts of things that would be the right next thing to do. We don't know what it is at this stage and we can't predict. Um, and a lot of clients will accept that that is something worth doing. It sounds promising um, and they'll, they'll go for it. Um, but And if it works, it's great because once the clients got into that process, they will never come out of it. They'll just um, always be thinking of something else they want to do with the model, how they want to expand it or change it or rebuild it and, and further investigation they, they want to do. So it's worked very successfully for us on occasion. And the other one, um, we didn't have a name for it until two days ago when I was thinking what I'm going to put on this slide. I call it now the flexible clause approach. And basically, you do respond to the tender. You know, you have a full-scale model specification, um, but in there, you say that the project will start with a workshop. And somewhere in those clauses, you say that by mutual agreement, we will all accept change requests. And so the client accepts that the project may change and you may well not do um, what you build, that you, what you said in the specification you would do in the first place. Um, I skipped over it because I thought there probably wasn't time to go into all the explanation around it, but there was a, a picture that you will have seen flick by <coughs> of our standard weekly report that we do. And um, that is one of the things that makes these sorts of projects work because in it you're absolutely explicit about the things that you have done this week that were not in the original specification. Because the client will always be saying, well that's interesting, let's investigate that. And you could say, oh well, that's not in the specification. That's going to be another £10,000, please. And make them get that signed off and delay for a couple of weeks while somebody approves it. But instead, we just get on with it. And we put into the weekly report what we've done that's extra. And we also, with agreement with the person we're talking to, put into that report the things that will probably be deleted off the end of the project so to accommodate that in the, in the time frame. And we also put in that weekly report what the team has learned by actually doing that, um, that week's work. Not, the, not what the client has learned, because that's a bit insulting. Because lots of clients will say, well, I should have known that in the first place. Um, and not what we have learned, it's actually what the whole team has learned. So they're documenting all the time the thing that they've learned by, by actually going through the project in the way they have. Um, 
Right, well that's all I intend to say. Um, questions? Or Stuart, are you going to do that? Please do it. Yeah. My experience with simulation has been uh, in industry where there's always a, a hunger to turn an exploratory, possibly an exploratory model, or even a model to gain understanding into something which gets integrated into the decision-making process on a continuous basis. Yes. Do you understand that situation? Because you can stay, as an external consultant, with a sort of modelling project, you can, stay out, you can easily stay out of that. Well, um, yeah, yes and no, because it's when it happened, it would be quite lucrative for us. Yeah. <laughs> so we want it to happen. But is it the sort of work you want to get involved in on a continuous basis? Um, the thing is, y yes, but only after the model's evolved quite a bit. Because you see the model being used to sort of design a process, um, almost like a kind of capital investment stage. Mm -hmm. And then it's used to, um, on a kind of fairly odd hack hop, ad hoc basis early on, run that process. Mm -hmm. Because people are saying oh, the process is not working now, you know, months into the using it, it's not working any longer, what's wrong, let's use that model again to yeah, investigate yeah, what's wrong. Yeah. And then they start to say, well hang on a minute, actually we have this problem every day, because in the classic case is a call centre, you don't know what staff are going to turn up until they turn up. And so we want to rerun the simulation at the start of every day. Um, we, we did a project with New Zealand Inland Revenue, where they had exactly that problem. Different staff turn up each day. Um, they want to use the staff in different ways um, on different days, depending on what staff they've got there and what type of calls they're expecting at that time of year. But they don't know how to use them because it's so difficult to make the judgment. So they said, why don't we take this simulation which we've built and rerun it automatically at the beginning of each day to work out how much flexibility we're going to have during the day for taking staff off and training them, because to train them you'll send them off the phones, but we don't know which staff to take off when. So that's a, a really good example of something that started off as a kind of um, big decision type model that evolved into something that was operationally used every day. And it's right as long as it has gone through that evolution process, and it's not something I don't think you could do that if you were going to set out and write a specification from scratch without having done any modelling at all. Yeah. You, you have to evolve it to get there. And interestingly, New Zealand Inland Revenue, that they make massive use, they, they, they used, they've used simulation for 10 years. Um, we've only been involved in them for about five years. Um, but they've got really into it and they really believe in it. And because of it, um, actually not using the model, but because they were very agile, because they're continuously using the model and they understand their processes well, they were the fastest department by a long way to get back up running after the earthquakes. So they lost one of their call centres, it was completely destroyed in Christchurch, and yet they were up, back up at full capacity using their other three call centres um, in about three days. And every other de government department wants to know how they've managed it. And it was because they, they're they good at managing the process because they've got used to using simulation to understand how to make the process work. Oh. Colin. Do you think the IT world has stolen our idea that you've just described and called it agile? agile. Yes. Or can we <laughs> learn from the agile movement to make our world better? Um... Yeah, I think we can learn, but we don't, as it were, take it far enough. Um, I mean, I don't know much about Agile, but I've heard about it. And um, it's something that our development team apparently uses. Um, and it does seem to work quite well in the sense that they come out with lots of things quite quickly. Um, but I don't think it is quite... Is, it's not rest, what we're doing here is recognising that we're actually helping the client learn. You know, we're trying to use a modelling process, not just the model, but also the modelling process, to get the client to be able to think more rationally about the problem they're trying to solve. And it's recognising that 
in the process of doing modelling that I think I'm trying to urge people to do. So it's not about the model, it's about the process that you take the client through. And the model is um, a kind of um, piece of that that is used throughout the process. Peter Miller. <coughs> yeah, sorry. And um, all of that work has been on the secret with me. Uh, myself as a geriatrician, the um, say a service. I'm sorry, I just had a, a, a we knew the answer. Right. We were going to change the people. Taking in a hundred days to the residential care to ninety days. Right. No, 90, ninety days, yes. So that's because there were twenty eight people who were urgent and four hundred which were unurgent, but urgent and unurgent. Mm -hmm. So we had to be secret. And we told put, put a, a panel. I would stay in the hospital ward and I agreed with the team yeah. that that was the right decision. And then I would go back to the panel, which we'd set up, and we'd say it's not the right decision. Mm -hmm. Try and that try for another four weeks. Right. And by doing that, we changed the service completely. Now the mathematics, I've had arguments, arguments. My wife wouldn't come with me uh, anywhere because I Sally, Sally uh, and I argued mm. like her. And it's only just now that you've been looking at models and to what is the actual happen. The way it will behave. Yeah, but the people interaction side of it, which you're talking about there, absolutely must happen. And it's one of the ones that I kind of skipped by because I thought I didn't have enough time was uh, about the project we did at um, a new hospital in Edinburgh where um, without going into all the details of it, at the end of the project, the chief executive came to us and said you know, this has really transformed our thinking. We've got a completely new idea out here on how we're going to deal with this issue in the hospital. Uh, and then he said, but the, isn't the interesting thing that the idea didn't come out of the model? And in fact, the idea was never built, we didn't build the idea into the model. The idea emerged because the model was bringing together all the parties who were involved in the decision. And they wouldn't normally get together, these people. They only came together for these meetings around our model. And the fact that you get people together to talk means that they will um, they'll develop ideas that they have a shared belief in. You know, just as in the car factory, people were coming together and traditionally always the body build part of the plant fights with the assembly part of the plant <laughs> and the poor paint shop suffers the bashing in between. And with these models where you can look across the whole plant and get everybody discussing it, suddenly they didn't have arguments any longer. The model acted as their kind of rational thing to, to remove the arguments and let them have a shared understanding of how the way things should operate. Yeah, that's what we were after. Ten empty beds. Seventy years, seven years later, you'll have thirty empty beds mm -hmm. because it's a, a, a two and two years, six months is about average in the right. resident. And those, that gave us ten beds to admit 120 people for a month, 10 beds to bring in uh, 520 people a week, mm -hmm. and 1,387 five days just to get in one day. Right. And doing that, we changed that system over seven years to one which is the star of everything and you never tell me how to it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's just there's one question at the back, Roger, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish with that. You must have had a few projects that actually hit a brick wall. 
Well, I mean, I was well, but I was. Lessons to be learned from those. The other, the other um, day, I was reflecting on. You know, I'm telling you about all the failures here because you don't learn anything from the successes. So, to some extent, these these are the ones that hit yes. the brick wall um, because you, they're more interesting. Um, we must have had some that are complete disasters. Um, probably we have. We have well, but a long time ago, uh, 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 the disaster that I actually wrote up in my PhD was was actually a really good example of how not to do what I've been talking about, because we had lots of success of, with this visual interactive simulation in, in, in BL. One of the plants came to us when it was first opening and said, right, we want a simulation model of our, our entire plant. And stupidly, we didn't say, why? <laughs> we just said, okay, yeah, we'll build a model of your entire plant. And we did. And of course, it was completely useless at answering any question because it hadn't been designed to answer a question. It was, it was either at too much detail or not, an, not enough detail for any part of the plant. And we, we spent about 18 man months building the model. And it was never used on anything useful. Did you get paid? Yeah, <laughs> this was British Leyland. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's an ex a, a complete failure is an excellent moment. <laughs> <laughs> but what it does lead me to is having started with an interesting PhD to read, I'm now motivated to read Mark's PhD as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we thank Mark for his excellent... Uh,